Welcome to the Cerebral Edge with strength and conditioning specialist, Coach Chris. Join us for the next 30 minutes as Coach Chris shares ways to improve your health in all areas of your life. Along with his special guests, he strives to give you that cerebral edge to help make you 1% better every day. Now, here's Coach Chris. This is the Cerebral Edge on Power Talk 1040 KPPF. This is Coach Chris, and I'm here to give you the edge to be 1% better every day. From a star-studded cast right now, we've got Dr. Grove Higgins in the house. We've got Morgan Flaherty, Wes Barnett, a two-time All-American, American, American, and Nathan Craig. Thanks for all coming in. Go ahead. We'll start over with my buddy, Dr. Grove. Go ahead and give us a little bio of yourself, what you've been doing. Yeah, I'm Dr. Grove Higgins. I'm a chiropractor and a rehabilitationist uh, here in Monument, Colorado, and I've been on the show before, so you can look me up there. Absolutely. Morgan. Uh, hi, my name is Morgan Flayhardy. I'm a Team USA Greco Roman wrestler, uh, strength and conditioning coach, and physiologist. Excellent. Mr. Wes Barnett. Wes Barnett, 1992 1996 Olympian in the sport of weightlifting. I uh, had the fortunate uh, pleasure of living at the Olympic Training Center for about 10 years. Um, after that career, I went and worked for the Olympic Committee for about 15 years after that, and currently um, I work for a nutritional supplement company, Thorn Research. And, yeah, so Nathan Craig, I am uh, currently a warrant officer with the Army National Guard here in Colorado, um, and I also run an online training team for uh, primarily military and law enforcement. Awesome. So you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? We got a star studded cast here. One even has his own Wikipedia page. Do you have your own Wikipedia page too, Morgan? Or? Could be. Could be out oh, there somewhere. I don't know about it if it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> right it's on. False information if it is. <laughs> <laughs> False information. So the first question that we're going to get into is what does fitness mean to each of you folks? Well, don't start with me. I get to fix it when it fails. So. Right. Yeah. Shoot. Well, I mean, I've always I always appreciated the origin the ri- original definition of fitness in the way that Darwin put it out there. And this is just because it's nice to have an anchor for where a word kind of started Mm -hmm. and then kind of go from there and let it evolve naturally. So I always liked how Darwin put it in perspective that like fitness is a species capable that is uh, suitable for its environment Mm -hmm. and how it evolves with respect to that environment. And I like how nowadays you can see how the paradigm of different sports and different, um, how do I say like different groups of people are are navigating in different areas and trying to maximize their potential within certain groups and Mm -hmm. you can see how these people are now specifying their training in order to maximize the result within certain things so i think that kind of fits along darwin's kind of idea of fitness in that Mm -hmm. you are evolving with your desire and you're adapting to that specific lane that you're in Mm -hmm. with your environment yes gotcha which in the metaphor of the environment for us is our training and Mm -hmm. the demands of sport Mm -hmm. or military and law enforcement yeah absolutely Wes or or everyday life really it's uh you know my my definition is is right along those same lines but it's it's more um you're able to do whatever it is that you're doing in a manner that you're not injuring yourself while you're doing it. So Mm -hmm. whether you are uh, a mom being able to put your kids in a car seat without wrenching your back, there's a certain level of fitness that um, uh, that's required for that. So I think it's individual for each person and depending on what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, it's going to look different from everybody, but if you can do it in a way that um, is efficient and you're not hurting yourself, that to me is uh, is definition of fitness. Mm-hmm. And Nathan, for me, I, I think it's just preparation of whatever your uh, end outcome is going to be. So it can even delve into like financial fitness or mm-hmm. something that's more broad. So I like it. So to me, it's just the the overall preparation. Right. So it's the overall preparation, building habits, so that way you can do whatever your environment is demanding of you, whether that's get your kids, right? Whether that's be a, an all-American wrestler or weightlifter, whatever it is that you're doing out there, um, the definition of fitness is basically to be able to do what you're doing to the best of your ability, mm-hmm. correct? Yep, and if it's done well, 
Uh, it keeps you uh, immune from the uh, repetitive effects of the things that you do. Right? Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that you get to walk away from you know weightlifting without some damage or or, or wrestling or whatnot. Um, we still have to keep up with those things, but the, the the better the level of fitness matches the end goal, the mm -hmm. the desired outcome that uh, you want from your body, your mind, your finances, yeah. and things like that, uh, you walk away with less damage, and so then you spend less time uh, remediating those 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 defects, and you get to move forward and continue to move forward in your sport or in your mm -hmm. goals in life. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's why when people come to me, I like to call everybody an athlete. But they don't think of it that way, right? Because they're like, well, I'm not out there, you know, shooting hoops or wrestling. I'm like, no, but you got to live life. And you have to use your body to live life, right? So the better you can get your body's ability to adapt to what you're doing, you're going to be better off. And you're going to have less pain. And you're going to be better for your friends and your family, correct? Absolutely. And I think it all starts with, with a great foundation, right? Mm -hmm. Having the, the building blocks... Uh, to build off of, um, and you know, Dr. Higgins just mentioned after your career, you know, there are those things that you have to uh, kind of pay for, um, you know, <laughs> that you did, the, you know, the torture that you put yourself through while you were competing. But mm -hmm. uh, I was very fortunate. I, I've never had a surgery. I've never had a broken bone. I had a 17-year weightlifting career, lifting a lot of weights mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of days. Uh, but it was because I think that I had coaches in the very beginning who cared more about my long-term development Longevity. than their um, ability to say, hey, you know, look where I got this kid, you know, now, you know, let me be the head coach for, for such and such a team. Mm -hmm. It was really all about me and all about my progress um, over the years. So when I came to the Olympic Training Center, you know, we probably, during my years there, we probably had gone through over a hundred different athletes who could not sustain the level of training that we were uh, undergoing. We were going six days a week, twice a day mm -hmm. uh, for years. That's how we trained. A lot of guys could not handle it um, at all. And I think it was because they didn't have a very good base. Mm -hmm. I had this tremendous base with great coaches who built me up and prepared me to be ready for that kind of load. So I was able to go through my career pretty much unscathed other than some overuse type injuries because of the repetitive nature of, of my sport. But um, when the career was over, I walked away and, you know, I still feel pretty good. I have to see Dr. Higgins every now and again. <laughs> That's more for Who doesn't? trying to keep up with, uh, with my kids these days. I like that. Everybody should have an excuse. To <laughs> Everybody should have a Dr. Higgins in their corner, let me tell you. Did you notice a, uh, a time frame when you saw that shift from from less preparation in the athletes coming in? Yeah, I mean, I was probably uh, 20 years old, and uh, I was just kind of like rocking and rolling. There, there was nothing you could throw at me that could that could break me down. It was it was that sort of preparation. So, I started lifting when I was 12 years old. Uh, that was my first competition, and that's a whole other story in and of itself. But uh, from the from the age of 12, you know, that eight year building block until I came and, and started living at the training center, that was that was my foundation. Where a lot of guys, it was it was really about how much can I lift uh, as quickly as I can so that I can make this team or I can make that team. A lot of people don't realize I was on two Olympic teams. I won a single number one national junior championship and that wow. was in my oldest year so I got destroyed year after year after year after year because my coaches weren't really thinking about how much you can lift it was all about a longer plan and and kind of building up to that they weren't metal focused they were you focused correct right and you had Dragomir right which was, he's like the Eastern, or, right? Yeah, Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe. Um, and they have a really good philosophy, too, when it comes to training, right? Because they believe in building GPP first, or general physical preparedness first, before they start mm -hmm. adding load. So do you think that helped you out quite a bit? It, it did in my early years, because we did not um, uh, specialize in the lifts. We did the lifts, snatch and clean and jerk. Mm -hmm. But we did circuit training, we did dumbbells, we did 
you know, all sorts of GPP mm -hmm. um, activities that I think over the years, that's what, what helped me get to the point where now my body was in a position and a state where now you could throw this specific training on me with loads and loads of snatch, clean and jerks, back squats, front squats, and pulls, and I wasn't going to break down because I had that foundation. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that, guys? I, I had a little bit of a thought on, like, it, it's interesting how there is, uh, when we're talking about the athletes and, you know, the, the fitness of a certain of a certain athlete, there's, I, I feel it's kind of funny how, uh, athletes are put on this pedestal of being the fittest in the world um, when they are f the fittest at the world at their specific task. And I think that's really important because um, a lot of the times we consider, oh, our athletes, uh, because they're admired, we assume that athletes are healthy yeah. um, in that notion. But I always felt like at this level, at that level of athletics, you're almost like always flirting with that line. Right on that line. You know, you push a little bit too hard too soon, you, you're going to end up getting sick or getting um, or getting hurt. But that's where you have to flirt if you want if you want to find that limitation to that maximum amount of stress that you can tolerate. And then the longer you can tolerate that stress, mm -hmm. you know, safely, the higher that adaptation that's going to come. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't recommend that level of stress on a daily life f for anybody else that isn't trying to particularly push a specific adaptation you know within their within their bodies and mm -hmm. you know when you mention that the that long period of building that base it's like this is kind of putting that like that investment in that enables an athlete mm -hmm. to have that longer career mm -hmm. because they don't have to push so hard at the end of their career in order to make those final to make those final pushes um or to make that peaking uh so high or to be so desperate because they've already developed those <clears throat> systems they've already developed that that physiology that can enable them to uh be prepared when competition rolls around and they mm -hmm. just have to manipulate minor stresses so that way they can you know super compensate when they need to mm -hmm. there was there was a great line that i heard somebody say i said if you want to be healthy don't compete yeah right yeah because you have to flirt with that line so much right and and you can get very very broken and sometimes you have to push through that brokenness. So you're right. Sometimes you put athletes on this pedestal. They might not be the healthiest, though. No, not at all. Well, and sometimes it's about experience, too, right? Because yep. what is the saying? You don't know what the edge is. and Sometimes you have to go off the cliff to, sure. to understand where the, where the edge is. Yes. So in my career, you know, nothing, there wasn't times where things never happened. But those were the, the learning processes where you knew how far you could push. And, and I was always wanting to kind of push the boundaries, you know, to see, you know, how far do I go before this actually breaks? Mm -hmm. And then once you find that out, okay, now you can kind of dial it back a little bit. And I think flirt with that line with a little bit more, um, you know, uh, thought mm -hmm. um, because you know now how far you can, you can push that envelope. And it changes as your career goes on, but to to Morgan's point, which was a good one, um, as I got older, I, I realized, and it wasn't until the end of my career, I realized I didn't have to do as much to get the same uh, results or, or to, to get the uh, result that I was looking for. Uh, and I went through lots of injuries and things because I was still trying to train when I was 28, 29, like I was when I was 20, 21. And it just wasn't working. And uh, finally, something dawned on me. One of my teammates, actually, the way that he was training, I'm like, how is it that you are just always, you know, up, up, up? You're never injured, this and that. He's like, well, I basically follow the program. And, and <laughs> my, right, right. Because my thing was more is better. Right. Always more is better. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I got older, it was not the case. And, and it wasn't until I, I had that communication with my teammate and I started to kind of dial it back a little bit I got healthier and oh by the way my lifts were still going up <laughs> all right and you're feeling better absolutely so that way when you, your joints feel good right you can lift more that's right all right I feel like that's like an American curse of training <laughs> because of all or nothing yeah I and mean, there are some you know people that have historically succeeded and championed their sport 
and just from the notion of that they worked harder than absolutely everyone else and it's like indoctrinated into the culture that yeah. like hardest work in the room yeah and and you know there i think it's i think there's a lot of value to that in learning like mm -hmm. the ethic that's involved that like never never say no to more work work if that's what you have to do right but if what you have to do is take time and recover um then you must prioritize what's going to help you succeed the most and um you know i'm 32 now yeah with, oh i'm 32 now and so i have to change the way that i approach my training and also just being around um you guys and all of the professionals it's you can't be dumb about training anymore anyways mm -hmm. because uh there's too much information that just doesn't allow you to be you can only get lost in the weeds of like oh, do I do this and do that? But at the end of the day, you know, prioritizing what's most important um, is about not adding more things in, but taking away things that don't help. Mm -hmm. And that way your body can really make those advancements um, in the areas that are the things that are holding you back mm -hmm. or preventing you from reaching your potential. Excellent golden nuggets here, guys. I guess hope you guys have your pen and paper out, taking some notes with these great minds talking about fitness. We'll be right back here on the Cerebral Edge on Power Talk 1040 KPPF. We are back on the Cerebral Edge with Power Talk 1040 KPPF with Coach Chris. And my star-studded guest right here, my star-studded panel of friends. Um, and right now I kind of want to get into, because we were always talking about how to flirt with the line between um, training and being healthy and all that. And right now I want to really emphasize to folks out there the difference between exercise and training. So I kind of want to get you guys' thought on that. So we'll start with Dr. Grove Higgins. What's your thoughts on the difference between exercise and training? Yeah. So in training, training, there's a there's an end goal, right? Um, and uh, un unfortunately, so much of people's fitness, and I use air quotes with that, so much of people's fitness is geared around the exercises that they're doing, right? Um, I, I I love uh, listening to, and I don't remember where the motto is. So Nate, you probably can pull it out for me. Move, fight, uh, recover. Move, fight, recover, right? Move, fight, recover. <laughs> but but now how the how the operator particularly. Um, how th there is no workout of the day. There's no there's no exact load, things like that, because their life is variable and they have to just be ready at all at all times. Um, the exercise doesn't prepare you for that. The training does. It's a, it has an endpoint to it, and so then you might fix exercises within that, but it doesn't take you to the goal. And training does. And so a lot of times when I see somebody that's broken uh, if, and they're on my table because their back is hurt, they've blown out a shoulder, whatever it might be, it's because they've oftentimes focused on the wrong aspect and they've developed their fitness in the, in the way that makes them weak, not stronger. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought uh, exercise and fitness, uh, or excuse me, exercise and training, they're they're, they can be mutually inclusive, yeah. um, but there is a very important distinction that I like to make, and that exercise is done for its own sake. And so you can go out on a run and enjoy the run. You'll surely benefit from that run, mm -hmm. um, but that's not that. That is the point of the of the run is to enjoy the run and benefit from it. Versus training, I feel like is has like Dr. Grove said. It has an end goal, but it's also, it's a process. Like each session is designed to get you to that specific goal. It's not done for its own sake. It's done for the goal's sake, and it has to be along this line of progress towards that specific goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, developing progress, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Wes? Well, I, I think that I have a, a, a sickness then because um, <laughs> I, physic I just can't exercise. Right. I, I can't. I can't just go out and do things for the pleasure uh, or the sake of doing things. I always have to have a purpose, something that I'm that I'm trying. So I will go for, you know, months at a time, you know, doing absolutely nothing because I don't have anything that I'm quote unquote training for. 
Uh, so I have to like, what I like to do is I paint myself in a corner and I'll, I'll sign up for, you know, a century ride or something like that, where now I know, and I, of course, give myself a very short period of time to do it. So now I know that every session that I'm on the bike or everything that I'm doing, there's a specific purpose behind it. Uh, and that's just something that I've, I've just never been able to, you know, my whole life really just kind of exercise for the sake of doing it. I, I just always have to have this this uh, this purpose in mind, this mm-hmm. goal, somebody to beat, somebody to compete against. And, uh, you know, maybe that's just an illness that I that, that I have <laughs> that, you know, but that's just how I'm wired. Yeah. I think an easy way for people to think about it is if they think of exercise as more of a health focus. Mm-hmm. So you can start looking at maybe it's the enjoyment, which is the psychological mental health focus of it, or, you know, it's the actual health benefits of cardiovascular and strength training and all those things. Now, on the training side, like Doc said, uh, a lot of the law enforcement military, we have this issue with there's too much variability. The reality is that we know a lot of the things that we're going to do, but a lot of a lot of the operators and the, the athletes and whatnot just don't know how to train for that. Mm-hmm. So what I recommend is an 80% solution is train for and play recreation and team sports. If you yeah. can do that, chances are you're going to move the needle in the right direction. So yes, there's all this variability in your job, yes, but... If you're playing, say, street hockey like I do, chances are you're probably going to get a lot of the physiological stuff you need. You're going to get the psychological mm-hmm. stuff. You're going to get the reactivity. You're going to get a lot of the things you actually need for that position. And as you start getting down that pathway of training for said sport, you're going to start to learn how to actually implement your job skills mm-hmm. into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, that's, and that is a, an <clears throat> important thing. He brought up the aspect of fun. Um, if training's not fun, uh, then we, we tend to uh, tend to drive down the wrong path a lot of times, right? We emphasize something, uh, overemphasize one aspect too much and develop that too well to the detriment of everything else. Because being an athlete, being a human being, you know, is, is everything from, you know, flexi- mobility, flexibility, you know, strength, speed, power, all of those qualities that make an athlete. And if you're not pushing yourself in all of those directions, you become unbalanced, and that's unfortunately where it breaks, and then you're not having fun. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, and I, and I love the fact that they're playing different sports, right? Because that's always emphasized for youth people, too, to avoid injuries because they're using a lot more musculature versus just a specific skill, right? Like you talked about earlier, just using weightlifting as a specific skill. You didn't do that for a long time, right? You did a lot of other things before you went to your exact sport. So when they're operators, right, they're going to be using all this different muscles that they don't normally use, which is going to keep them safer, right? Yeah, it's going to build that resiliency and and range of motion and and experiencing, um, you know, mobility that you may not experience otherwise. You know, gym stuff is going to be very limited, but the sport's going to get you out of that gym mode and kind of get you into a variety of things, especially the team sports with the reactivity and the visual stuff. So I know Doc really focuses on vision, but that Mm -hmm. sports vision is really critical for uh, these these variable type sports where you have to react to stimulus Mm -hmm. visually. And so I think the the, the team sports tend to help with a lot of that. Yeah, that's a really great point. And and I did, I played team sports my whole career, baseball, basketball, football growing up. And and I think that um, that athleticism um, also contributed to the longevity and the success that you know one would have in their career uh, because you're so well rounded. You didn't specialize too early, mm-hmm. uh, so that's a that's a really important point that Nate just made. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good because a lot of people think of it in youth terms, but even me sitting here, I didn't think about it as like an operator level or you know mm-hmm. firefighter level or whatever. You know, to be able to have that um, diversity of training, which is awesome. And I, I really appreciate uh, about that uh, outlook is that it's there's always a level of unpredictability unpredict- in team sports and settings mm-hmm. like that. And, you know, with respect to law enforcement or military, you, you have to communicate, you have to read the field, you have to be aware of your surroundings all the time. Mm-hmm. And then with respect to the longevity in sport and exercise and training, it's like, you, you're, you can continue to push the needle as if you're training, mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily have to be done in a manner. Like exercise can be done in a manner that it has an effect like training, but the but conceptually having the separation is important to understand. Um, 
in terms of how you drive your progress and how and, and the aim for which something is done specifically. And to your point about the injuries and all of and how that happens when someone is a little bit off balance, it's um, off balance with their lifestyle and things along those lines. Well, the unpredictability in these team sports and these in the variability of all those different sports, they're going to put you in those positions that you're not always exposed to. And usually you get hurt when you're in a position that you're not prepared to be in mm-hmm. and you push yourself a little bit too hard. So if you have like the note, so if you're having fun, you're playing a game and you're not going like all out for competition, then you can be exposed to those like micro stresses or just... Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a little. Bit, I mean, it's a little bit too harsh, micro stresses. But like, you're you're exposed to different scenarios and stuff, and different stimulus. Yeah, yeah. the stimuli, yeah. and and those little stimuli, they're going to add up over time, and that's going to really help one move in the right direction towards being more prepared for their work, whatever that, it may be. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. We had a lot of good golden nuggets. Stay tuned next week because I'm going to have the same panel back again here on the Street Bridge on Power Talk 1040 KPPF. This has been the Cerebral Edge on KPPF. Have a question for Coach Chris? Email him at CerebralEdge1 at gmail.com. That's CerebralEdge, the number one, at gmail.com. Join us next Saturday at 1 p.m. and Sunday at 1030 a.m. for another episode of the Cerebral Edge with Coach Chris on Power Talk 1040 KPPF.